Our scripture reading in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel, chapter 22, as we'll be continuing in uh, David's psalm that is inserted there in his life, 2 Samuel, chapter 22. We'll begin with verse 29. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. By thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God, save the Lord? Who is a rock, save our God? God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. For you have girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he answered them not. And then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the streets and did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen, a people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves to me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avenges me, and that brings down the people under me, and that brings me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. He is a tower of salvation for his king, and shows mercy to his anointed, unto David and to his seed forevermore. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Continue our worship with the giving of tithes and offerings. From the website of the Westminster Abbey, their article on Isaac Watts, Dr. Isaac Watts. In the South Choir Isle of Westminster Abbey is a marble mural monument to nonconformist minister and hymn writer Isaac Watts. It shows a relief of Dr. Watts seated in his study with an angel guiding his pen 
with his bust above. The monument is signed by sculptor Thomas Banks. The, ins the inscription reads, Isaac Watts, Doctor of Divinity, born July 17th, this day, 1674, died November 25th, 1748. He was born in Southampton, a son of Isaac and Sarah Watts, educated locally and at a dissenting academy. He then became a tutor and assistant to an independent church, church at Mark Lane in London, to which he was later elected minister. He wrote poems, religious works, and psalms, as well as hymns, such as When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. He is buried at Bunhill Field Cemetery in London. And also from the Westminster Abbey website, the entry for George Handel. On the wall above his grave is a fine monument by the sculptor Louis-Francois Rebiliac, with the same inscription as on the stone, but with the dates in Roman numerals. The life-size statue unveiled in 1762 and Watts and Handel were contemporaries. It's said to be an exact likeness as the face was modeled from a death mask. Behind the figure, among clouds, is an organ with an angel playing a harp. On the left of the statue is a group of musical instruments and an open score of his most well-known oratorio, Messiah, composed in 1741. Directly in front of him is the musical score I know that my Redeemer liveth. The index finger of his left hand had been missing for a long time, and a new one has recently been sculpted to replace it. If you take your hymn book and turn to the first hymn we sang this morning, Joy to the World, 149, Joy to the World. Above the first line of music on the left, you see Isaac Watts, 1719, the date that he wrote this text. And to the right, you see Antioch, the name of the hymn tune written by Lowell Mason in 1836. Mr. Mason took some ideas from Handel's Oratorio Messiah and wrote this hymn tune. And it says, based on George Frederick Handel, 1742. And I've always loved the story that in Westminster Abbey, where England's finest rest, you have Dr. Isaac Watts and George Handel wrote this hymn that we sing at Christmas time. It's really one of those Christmas carols that we could sing year round. We could sing it year round. And I, I love the fact that Dr. Watts says in the present tense, the Lord is come. He has not come. The Lord is come. The Savior reigns. Not that He reigned. He reigns. He comes. Not He came, but He comes to make His blessings flow. And He rules the world. Not He ruled the world or He will rule the world. He rules the world. A couple of other hymns that we're singing this morning, one that I, I think is just one of the finest hymns in the English language. And I'm so grateful for this text, the busy tribes of flesh and blood with all their lives and cares are carried downward by the flood and lost in following years. Time, and this is one of my all-time favorite verses in all of hymnody, time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while troubles last 
and our eternal home. The last hymn that we'll be singing this morning, this is another of my favorite stanzas. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to loose his chains. The weary find eternal rest. One of my favorite lines in all of hymnody. And all the sons of want are blessed. All the sons of want are blessed. I love Mr. Watts. He was a brilliant man, a dear brother, a dear pastor. Many people do not know this, but Dr. Watts wrote a textbook on logic. I encourage you to find a copy, and while you read it, have a pot of coffee and some Madeline cookies, <laughs> because it is very, very deep. Dr. Watts was a brilliant man, and in the dedication to his text on logic, the right use of reason in the inquiry after truth, he says, it has been my endeavor to form every part of this treatise, both for the instruction of students to open their way into the sciences and for the more extensive and general service of mankind that the, that the gentleman and the Christian might find their account in the perusal, as well as the scholar. I have therefore collected and proposed the chief principles and rules of right judgment in matters of common and sacred importance and pointed out our most frequent mistakes and prejudices in the concerns of life and religion that we might better guard against the springs of error, guilt, and sorrow which surround us in every state of mortality. And on the back, Sola del Gloria reprinted this. As a child of Puritan parents, it is not surprising that Isaac Watts was greatly concerned about people's ability to think clearly. Whether a man was studying for the ministry or any other of the sciences, the ability to reason rightly was of utmost importance. We don't reason rightly these days. We do not. Watts' work on logic and reason became a standard textbook for nearly 200 years, being used in such schools as Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and Yale. I don't know about Oxford and Cambridge. They may still use this book, I don't know. But Harvard and Yale definitely need to be using this book because those two places have become wastelands. I love Dr. Watts, and I'm so grateful for his testimony. And I thank the Lord for giving to that man the gifts that he did. Let's pray. What joy we have, O oh Father, because the Savior is come. What joy we have that He rules the world with truth and grace. Oh, a great lesson for the rulers in our world this day. The princes and the kings who rule over us in this domain. Father, we so long, we so long to sing the songs of Zion. We are grateful for your working in the life of Isaac Watts, for giving him the abilities and the gifts that you did, that years later, centuries later, we still worship singing the hymns that he wrote and how dear they are to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us this place that we can come and sing and pray and hear your word being preached and worship the high King of heaven and earth, Christ 
our Lord. Amen. Five hundred ninety seven is our next Watts hymn this morning. If you'll turn there with me, five ninety seven. saints immortal reign infinite day excludes the night and pleasures banish pain their everlasting spring abides and never with ring flowers death like a narrow sea device a heavenly land from ours sweet fields beyond the swelling stand dressed in living green through the juice cane and stood while Jordan rolled between but timorous mortal star removed across this narrow sea and linger shivering on the brink and fear to launch away. Oh, could we make our doubts remove those gloomy doubts that rise and see the Canaan that we love with unbeclouded eyes. Could we but climb where Moses stood and view the landscape or not Jordan stream nor death's cold flood should fright us from the shore. Matthew chapter 10 for our New Testament reading. Matthew chapter 10. At the three o'clock service, Micah is going to begin preaching on the book of the Gospel of John. David's going to take a little break from the synopsis of the books, work on some of those little books like Jeremiah and Isaiah. And uh, Micah will be starting a new series um, at three o'clock. Mark chapter 10. And he arose from thence and came into the coast of Judea by the further side of the Jordan and the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? He answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said to them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. So then that they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house, the disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said to them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And they brought young children to him that, they, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And he said to them, Allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. 
And he took them up in his arms and his hands he put upon them and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said to the disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again, and he said, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And then Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Truly I say to you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen to him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that you, do, that you should do for us whatever we shall desire. And he said, What would you that I should do for you? And they said, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left hand, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, we can. And Jesus said to them, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall you be baptized? But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them and said to them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whoever of you will be the chief, chiefest, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Our God, our help in ages past is number 26. If you'd stand please, 26. <laughs> Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years. 
years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home under the shadow of thy throne thy saints have dwelt secure sufficient is thine arm alone and our defense is sure before the hills in order stood or earth received her frame so everlasting thou art God to endless is the same a thousand angels in thy sight are like an evening gone short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun the busy tribes and blood with all their lives and cares are carried downward by the flood and lost in following years. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Our God, our help in ages past, our years to Watts was asking God to be our guard while troubles last. So that's why his hymns are still good for today. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 22. We've been looking at the life of David, and we're coming to the end of the life of David. <clears throat> and chapter 22, there is inserted this one of the hymns of David, one of the Psalms. Of David, It says in the first verse that he spoke these to the Lord. So we see the spiritual nature of the Psalms. They are those that he in worship went to the Lord with. And they were preserved for the church as inspired of the Lord. He wrote it in that first verse when the Lord had delivered him out of all the hands of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. So it is a it's a hymn of gratitude, a hymn of thankfulness to God. <clears throat> and we've been looking at different sections of it. So I want us to come down to verse 31. We'll pick back up again. And I'd like us to look at 31 to 37 today. <clears throat> As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried, it's proved out. He's a buckler to all those who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like hinds feet and he sets me upon my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel or of brass is broken by mine arms. 
Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness has made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you again for your word. Your word is precious to us. It is the lamp that David spoke of, the light for our souls to give us understanding of who you are, who we are, what the world is, what your purposes are. It illuminates all things to us. And so as we enter into it again, we ask for thy ministry to us, the ministry of the Holy Spirit who illuminates the word to our souls, who gives us light and life and understanding uh, your precious word that you have preserved to us. Pray your blessings upon each soul that you have gathered here. You know the condition of each soul spiritually, Lord. We pray for thy intervention, for thy power in each and every heart and life, uh, that they, each one might be enabled to glorify thee as they ought because they were created by you. And we pray that you might bring redemption as well, that you would bring salvation to any who have not yet the joy of salvation in their souls. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to this section and looking at verse 32, which I want us to use as kind of a, a key verse for the section when David proclaims, for who is God except the Lord? Who is God save the Lord, only the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? As David has been talking about the help of God, the power of God, the manifestations of God, he's thankful to God. And now he speaks of the solitary nature of God, the solitary nature of God that he is God alone. So that number one, there is no God like our God. He is God who alone is God. And number two, we will see that he is God who alone rules in providence, making the way of his saints perfect, complete, smooth. Thirdly, he is God who alone can place us safely out of the reach of the enemy. Number four, he is God who alone can grant life and wisdom and ability to accomplish his purposes in my life and through me. Fifthly, he is God who alone condescends to men by his clemency. Sixthly, he is God who alone grants freedom to his people. So the solitariness of God, who is God save the Lord? Isaiah 45, five, Isaiah talks about the very same thing. He says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded you though you did not know me and that they may know from the rising of the sun to the west, there is none beside me. I am God, there is none else. And elsewhere he says, I know not of any. The solitariness of God, which doesn't mean God is alone, but it means that God alone is God. I'll read you a little bit of Pink's. Uh, there's the little book, Attributes of God. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's short, concise, but it has some beautiful, concise words about the nature and character of God concerning the solitariness of God. During eternity past, God was alone, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-satisfied, had need of nothing. Had a universe and angels and human beings been necessary to him in any way, they also had been called into existence from all of eternity. The creating of them, when he did, added nothing to God essentially. He changes not, and therefore his essential glory can neither be augmented or diminished. God was under no constraint, no obligation, no necessity to create. 
That he chose to do so was purely a sovereign act on his part, caused by nothing outside of himself, determined by nothing but his own mere good pleasure. For he works all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11. That he did create was simply for his manifestative glory. Do some of our readers imagine we have gone beyond what scripture warrants? Our appeal is to the law and testimony. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be his glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and all praise. The solitariness of God. Patrick wrote, for who is God save the Lord? None can defeat his intentions or resist his will. There are none so powerful as to be able to hurt those whom he wills to protect or defend those whom he wills to destroy. God alone is God. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 32, he is the rock, Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, without iniquity, just and right is he. There is none like God. And in Deuteronomy 32, 30, how should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up for their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges of this matter for their vine is the vine of Sodom, their fields of Gomorrah, their grapes, the grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass because their God is not our God. And our God is different than their God. Their God is the God of this world and he is cruel and sadistic. He is unloving, uncaring. He is a mocker and scorner of men made in the image of God. He does not love those who are under him, the God of this world, Satan. He mocks them. He destroys them. Our God alone is God. The solitariness of God. He is God who alone is God. Secondly, he is God who alone rules in providence, making the path of his saints perfect, complete, and smooth. Look at our text in 2 Samuel 22. So David says in verse 32, having recalled and thought about the goodness of God throughout his life, for who is God save the Lord and who is a rock save our God? There's only one God. And then he says, God is my strength and power and he makes my way perfect. Now look back at verse 31. In verse 31 it said, as for God, his way is perfect. And then David says, God is my strength and power who makes my way perfect. God's way is perfect and he's made my way perfect. So what does he mean by perfect there in the Hebrew? His way is perfect. It is complete. It is smooth. It is smooth. He makes my way entire, complete. My life is not disjointed. It's not a disjointed mess. It's not vanity of vanity, all is vanity. It has meaning and it has purpose. It is Ephesians 2.10. We are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We are the workmanship of God. We are the fabric. We are the pattern in the fabric, the life story of each and every one of God's saints. So our life is not disjointed. It is complete. He is the God who alone can work all things good for me. And I rest in that certainty. When things are dark, he's the lamp that he spoke of in verse 29. He is God alone who can make all things profitable for me. All things are made profitable to me. Not only does he work all things for my good, but he makes everything profitable to me. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we are, if we are the saints, we are part of God's family. He is our father. He disciplines us. He chastens us. He cares for us so that every circumstance of our life is something profitable for us because he makes it profitable for us. He makes our way perfect, complete, 
All things are useful to us. He is always educating us. It is the pedia of God that God is continually educating us through every circumstance. He instructs us, he chastens us, and he has instructive providences as well. What other God can boast of such a thing? The other gods are no gods and they can do nothing for us. But he can, in every circumstance and in every providence, make it profitable to us. All they can do for their followers, and of course they speak through their speakers because they can't speak. All they can do for their followers is to tell their followers to be passionless. Just be passionless. Go through life and be a stoic, feel nothing, and that is the greatest height of salvation for you. Well, we accept all as purpose, not fate, as love, not fate, as God, not emptiness of fate, the impersonal power. He is the personal God who works all things for our good, who we profit in all things. He is the God who makes all our path entire, complete, as the Hebrew word is, and the word means smooth as well. You say, well, my life doesn't seem that smooth. No, none of our lives are smooth, but God makes it smooth, you see. Jacob pillows his head upon a rock when he's fleeing Esau, but God gives him a vision of a staircase going to heaven with the angels ascending and descending upon it. And God's at the top. Christ is at the top saying that he is going to take care of Jacob in all the ways he goes, every path that he takes. And Jacob wakes up and says, God was here. And so he made his path smooth. Jacob was full of fears and doubts and had a rough night's sleep, I assume, if a rock was your pillow. But God made it smooth because he came to him and he talked to him and he said, I'll keep you in your way. Our path is rough, but he can smooth it out. He smooths it by his presence with us, by his promises that he gives to us, by his power that assures us that he can accomplish all of his purposes. Jacob's path was a bit rough with Laban, but God smoothed it out. He gave Jacob all of Laban's cattle. He gave Jacob his daughters, of whom the scripture says in the book of Ruth that the tribes of Israel were built with. And then when Jacob left and Laban was coming after him, God gave Laban a rebuke too. He smoothed Jacob's path. God does a lot of smoothing for us, and I bet there's a lot of things that we don't know about when God has smoothed some things out for us that one day we will learn. So he is the God who alone rules in providence to make my path smooth. John Calvin writes, God had opened up to him an even and accommodating pathway through places to which there was no means of access before. When David was reduced to the greatest distress and saw no way of escape, God had gloriously brought him out of his straits and his difficulties. A lesson which may be highly useful for correcting our distrust in God. When we don't see before us a beautiful and pleasant plain in which the flesh may freely enjoy itself, we are troubled as if the world would sink under our feet. Let us remember that the office of enlarging our ways and making them level belongs to God. In fact, we go to Isaiah chapter 40, where is the pronouncement of the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ who is to come. And in that pronouncement in the fourth verse, it says, He'll make the rough places plain. He'll make all things smooth because that's the salvation of our God. We may suffer. We shall suffer. But God smooths our tears when we have a remembrance of his love. And when we see something of the glory of God, 
That smooths the path. By the assurances of his salvation to our soul. By the love of other dear saints. David, you remember, had a recollection of being in the house of God worshiping that smoothed his path when he couldn't get to the house of God at that time. The path may be rough, but the promise is is that God smooths it. He smooths it by his spiritual blessings that he showers upon us. So first of all, he is God who is God alone. Second of all, he is God who alone makes our way perfect, complete, smooth. And thirdly, he is the God who alone can place us safely out of the reach of our enemies. He says in verse 34, and he makes my feet like hinds feet and he sets me upon my high places. A phrase which is, there's a famous book written on that and it's just a beautiful phrase that is useful to us because it it pictures for us uh, God's enabling grace, him setting us up on high and he uses the picture of the hind, perhaps it's the mountain goat. The mountain goat were renowned and in Job it's talked about as well and how they can jump from precipice to precipice to get away from any kind of enemy And then they can be up in the high places and they are there in the high places safe from any predator whatsoever. (laughs) I told you the story of the naturalist before. It just always comes to mind as he's watching these goats out west and they're going from one precipice to another precipice. And he knows if they go to the next precipice that there's no other precipice to go to and he's going to be stuck there. And he says, as he jumped, the naturalist shouted, no, don't do it. And the goat goes on there, and he jumps up and spins around, and he comes down again. And there was no stopping him. And that's how David felt as he recalled his life with God, that God had enabled him, had strengthened him, had put him out of reach of his enemies when his enemies should have had him. And because he is God who alone can place us out of the reach of our enemies. Job was touched by Satan's malice, but heaven prescribed what Satan could do. Habakkuk says the same thing. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. Moses faced treason over and over again, but God set Moses above his own enemies, sometimes his own people who wanted his death, sometimes his sister and his brother who were committing treason as well. But God set him above his enemies. Thomas Scott says, as the hinds climb the craggy rocks and stand firm upon the slippery summit of the precipice, so David had been upheld, in the most dangerous and slippery paths and advanced to his present exalted station by the providence and by the grace of God. And his extraordinary skill and strength in war must be ascribed to the same causes. A high place, a high place. God puts us in a high place where our enemies can't get us. A high place of safety is actually an humble place. So low that there's no danger of falling because that's how God brings men into the kingdom. As we read the camel, he has to go through the eye of the needle as well. It's an impossibility for man, but it's possible for God. God must humble the heart of man. And once man's heart is humbled and brought down so low, there's no danger of falling anymore because he's already low. So Christ gives the parable of the man and he says, when you go to a feast, when you go in, sit down at the low place, So then at that point, the only possibility is to go up. And so as God teaches us his own humility and humbles us, then we are placed upon his high place because there is no chance of falling and what our enemies say or do will matter little to us at that point. 
Matthew Poole says he places me in a safe and strong place. Places us above the gossip and slander of men, for we look to not men's thoughts or approvals, but God's alone. We are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus our Lord. Noah was placed above the waters of the wrath of God. He had salvation, and Christ was safe in his Father's bosom ever and always. He said, I am alone, but I'm not alone. My Father is ever with me. There is no greater height, no greater protection, no greater safe place than the favor of God. And David, David says, he is God alone who can place me in a safe place. Back to our text. It says, and verse 35, he teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel in the old King James, probably brass, it was metal, a metal bow, is broken by my arms, is broken by my arms. We know that metallurgy was known in the days of David. Some of the bows were made of metal. In one article it said the steel bows, while lacking in cast and range, were popular in India in the 1700s. They were both military weapons and status symbols, often handmade, hand-forged, with meticulous decoration. They would come in two pieces for easy transport. And David must have encountered some metal bows. And David must have, as Patrick said, he ascribes all his strength and dexterity to God who enabled him to rest, to take the strongest bow out of his enemy's hands and then break it in pieces. He is God who alone can give his children that strength the divine advantage. He grants to us wisdom, he grants to us uh, enablement, he grants to us uh, ability and power, so that David, in our text, he says, he teaches my hands to war. But you say, but David, didn't you go to military school for that? Sure, he did. Yeah, and probably his brothers taught him some things, and Saul taught him some things, and others taught him some things. But who was it? that placed David in his family? Who was it that put David in Israel? Who was it that brought David near to Saul? We can say we learned those things through these other aspects, but who was it that brought us into these places to be able to learn? He is a God who alone can give his children the divine advantage, the divine advantage. So that Nehemiah, when he's about to have to ask a king, a very important thing, shoots a prayer up to God. You know why? He's got a divine advantage there. Because he is God alone who can give his children such advantage. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. There were men in the temple who were given the spirit of God in a special way to fashion gold and silver and precious jewels and these were men probably who already had some skill, but they were given a skill above that skill by God. George Washington Carver used to walk the earth, and here in Alabama as well, and he was an inventor, and he was a Christian, and he would walk around the earth saying, I wonder what that's for, God. What should I use that for? How can I do that? And some of the poor churches in Alabama needed something to be able to paint them with, and so he asked the Lord about that, and he wondered what the Alabama red clay would be useful for, and the Lord helped him and showed him that the pigment could be used to turn into paint, and it could be done in a cheap way, and that these churches then could have their, a little bit of paint on their buildings to help them survive the Alabama weather. But he was a man who walked around with a divine advantage because God was his help the God who is God alone. The God who gives wisdom and ability to those who ask for it. And if you have not, you have not asked. Fifthly, he is the God who alone condescends to men of low estate. He is the God who forgives. 
He is a God of clemency, a God of clemency, which is what this Hebrew word seems to indicate when he says in verse 36, you have given me the shield of your salvation and your gentleness has made me great. Your gentleness, your condescension, the humility of God, the humbling of God, the coming of God down to deal with his creatures. Kyle and Dalich write, what is intended is that condescension of God to mankind, especially the house of David, which was in operation with an ultimate view to the incarnation in the life of the son of Jesse from the time of his anointing till his death. The one who elected the shepherd boy to be king and did not cast him off when he fell into sin. God's clemency has made me great, has made me invincible, fearless, with omnipotence for a shield. Because God's clemency makes us great. God's clemency is what makes us debtors to God. Debtors to God. John 8.10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and he saw none but the woman, woman caught in adultery, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more because she was now in debt. You belong to God. You don't belong to yourself. How could you belong to yourself? You didn't create yourself. God created you. He's the only one that you could be indebted to. You are bought with a price. In the book, which you probably haven't read because it's way too long, Victor Hugo's Less Miserables, but they do make a movie. But there's a great scene that he brings out, which is a, a wonderful example. Jean Valjean, <clears throat> the uh, prisoner who now is out of prison, and he shows up at this bishop's house. And the bishop treats him with all the kindness that he treats all the visitors that comes to him. And he does not give back to the bishop the same kindness. Jean Valjean is tempted by the silver he sees in the house and he, he takes it away, he steals some of it and leaves. Well, he's caught and he's brought back. And uh, as the brother and sister were leaving the table, there was a knock at the door, come in, said the bishop. The door opened. A strange and violent group appeared on the threshold, three men holding a fourth by the collar. The three men were gendarmes, the fourth was Jean Valjean. A corporal who apparently commanded the party came in and walked up to the bishop with a military salute. And he said, at this word, Jean Valjean, who was gloomy and crushed, raised his head with a stupefied air. He didn't know he was the bishop because he had not dressed in fineries. He had just been like a common man. And Monsieur, he, he muttered, then he's not the curé. Silence, said the gendarme. This gentleman is Monsignor the bishop. In the meanwhile, the bishop, welcome, had advanced as rapidly as his great age permitted. Ah, there you are, Jean Valjean. I am glad to see you. Why, I gave you the candlesticks too. They're silver. I'll, they'll fetch you 200 francs. Why did you not take them away with the rest of the plate? Jean Valjean opened his eyes and looked at the bishop with an expression no human language could render. Monsieur, the corporal said, what this man told us was true then? We met him, and as he looked as if he was running away, we arrested him. He had this plate. And he told you, the bishop interrupted with a smile, that it was given to him by the good old priest at whose house he passed the night. I see it all, and you brought him back here. That is a mistake. In that case, the corporal continued, we can let him go? Of course, said the bishop. 
The gendarmes loosed their hold of Jean Valjean, who tottered back. It is true. I am at liberty, he said, with an almost inarticulate voice, as if speaking in his sleep. Yes. You are let go, don't you understand, said the gendarme. My friend, the bishop continued, before you go, take your candlesticks. He went to the mantelpiece, fetched the two candlesticks, and handed them to Jean Valjean. The two women watched him do so without a word and without a sign, without a look that could disturb the bishop. Jean Valjean was trembling in all of his limbs, and he took the candlesticks mechanically with wandering looks. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. By the by, when you return, my friend, it is unnecessary to pass through the garden. You can always enter day or night by the front door. It's just latched. Then he turned to the gendarmes. Gentlemen, you can retire. They did so. Jean Valjean looked as if he were on the point of fainting. And the bishop walked up. And he said in a low voice, never forget that you have promised me to employ this money in becoming an honest man. And Jean Valjean, who had no recollection of having promised anything, stood silent. And the bishop, who had laid stress on the words, continued, Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. I have bought your soul. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. So that's just an earthly illustration. Nowhere is near to what God has done for us. He has bought our soul from evil, and we belong to him not to do evil, but to employ ourselves for the good of the kingdom of Christ. Because God's clemency makes us debtors to God. And he says, go and sin no more. You belong to God, not yourself. How could you belong to yourself? You didn't make yourself. You certainly didn't redeem yourself. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which belong to God. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you are bought with a price, don't be the servants of men. Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song and said, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals, for you are slain and you are redeemed to God by blood out of every kindred and tongue and tribe and nation who gave himself, Titus 2, who gave himself that he might redeem us, purchase us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a holy people. God's clemency makes us debtors. That's why David said, God's clemency has made me great. God's clemency makes us lovers of God. When they had dined, Jesus said to Peter, Simon Peter, The son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And he also said, when you were young, you girded yourself and you walked wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands and another will take you where you don't want to go. And this he spoke, signifying the death by which he should glorify God. Because God's clemency makes us lovers of God. And now Peter's love was stronger than death, whereas before it wasn't. The pulpit commentary says, what is intended is the condescension of God to mankind, especially to the house of David, which was in operation with an ultimate view to the incarnation. God had been good to David. Your clemency has made me great. David had no illusions about his own state. 
that it was by grace that he was in Christ, that it was by grace that he walked, that he needed grace, that he had needed forgiveness over and over again. And is that, it is that faithfulness of God that makes us great. It's certainly not ourselves that make ourselves great because we make ourselves lousy. It is God's clemency that makes us great. God's salvation. God is God who alone condescends to grant salvation, to give righteousness, to bring forgiveness. And then finally, he is God who alone grants freedom to his children. Freedom is a rare gift. Men don't like to grant freedom. Look around the world. It is the gift of God. Spurgeon said in verse 37, it says, you have enlarged my steps under me so my feet did not slip. This stability that there is in God and this wideness of salvation that we've looked at numerous times in this song. Spurgeon writes, a smooth pathway leading to spacious possessions and camping grounds had been opened up for him Instead of threading the narrow mountain paths and hiding in the cracks and corners of the caverns, he was able to traverse the plains and dwell under his own vine and fig tree. It is no small mercy to be brought into full Christian liberty and enlargement. But it is a greater favor still to be enabled to walk worthy of such a liberty, not being permitted to slip with our feet. To stand upon the rocks of affliction is a result of gracious upholding. But what aid is quite as much needed in the luxurious paths of prosperity? And Dr. Gill, he writes that my feet did not slip or perish. He says, Psalm 18 is expressive of deliverance from enemies by whom he was surrounded, besieged, and shut up in the freedom of walking at large than without being straightened for room. That's what God does for us in salvation the God who is God, the solitariness of God. God, he is God who alone is God. The solitariness of God means there is but one God. He is God who alone rules in providence to make your path perfect and complete and smooth by his grace and by his presence and by his promises and by the sweet crumbs of the word of God that he opens up to you. He is God who alone can place you safely out of the reach of the enemy. Lots of enemies out there. But in salvation, we are placed out of reach. He is God who alone grants you life and ability and wisdom to accomplish his purposes, the divine advantage which you have in Christ to walk with God and to have communion with God and to have that divine advantage by which he can teach you, instruct you, lead you, whether it's by his providence, by his word, however it is, he is constantly leading us and helping us. It's the divine advantage which you have in Christ. And he is God who alone condescends to men of low estate, a God of clemency, a God of clemency. Men don't like a God of clemency. You would think they would. They don't. They don't. They don't like the grace of God. They don't like the idea of Christ himself condescending to men. If you speak to them and speak of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, they mock it. It's weakness to them. It's because they haven't had their eyes open to the beauty of the clemency of Jesus Christ. They don't even think they need clemency. Ah, but he is the God who condescends to men of low estate. And he is the God who alone grants freedom to the saint. We may not have freedom in our land, but we have freedom in our soul. And it is something that can never be taken away. Because he is God alone who can give such a freedom in the soul. And so believers all around the world are free. Free in Christ. Free in Christ, free to serve the Lord in all things. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hymn of praise and thanksgiving and joy that David brings to us to speak of your greatness, of your solitariness, that you alone are God, that you alone 
accomplish all of your holy will, that you alone save all your people and bring them into such a state of comfort, protection, joy, peace, all the things you do for your people. And we ask, O oh God, now that you would accept our praise and thanks and gratitude for a remembrance of these things and a remembrance of who you are, that you would cause it to be deeply instilled in our hearts and into the hearts of our children as well. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would place your truth in the heart and soul of each one whom you've gathered here by your good providence. We thank you and praise you, O oh Lord. We thank you for the pardon and forgiveness of sins, for the great clemency there is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Save the lost among us, O oh God, and strengthen your people. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.